Today we touch on something of critical importance to understanding the solar system relationships, alignment effect versus gravitational clustering. In the previous episodes, we focused on the existence and potential mechanisms of the relationships, but now we must constrain the types of events that can cause certain changes in energy. The impetus is the properly timed but incorrectly interpreted concept flooding YouTube these days about all the planets on one side of the sun being of major importance. By the way, Ceres is not on that side, but hey, those are just details. Indeed, excluding Ceres, all the other planets are going to be over here for a few weeks. It has a scientifically real gravitational change, but nowhere near anything that would be of concern. Now, the critical question that is being asked is actually two questions. Will something major happen, and will this planetary clustering have any bearing on it? I'm just going to jump back to 1984 when this happened in almost the same arrangement, all planets being on one side, and this period was set during one of the longest stretches without a magnitude 8 earthquake on record. Note, the sun was quiet in 1984 and very quiet until about 1989. We can also look to another example when all the planets were on one side in 1995. I hope you're seeing these things do indeed happen with some regularity a few years to decades apart. Now, quite near the short-lasting planetary cluster, we did have a magnitude 8 earthquake. But on the date of it, which is just five days after this shot from 1995, we had the alignments of Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Earth, Mercury, Sun. That's a good deal of tuning fork-style induction potential between magnetic spheres in an electric field of solar wind plasma and interplanetary magnetic fields. Furthermore, this event occurred as the total solar polar magnetic fields were spiking to positive. Red stars marked the 8.0, so was it the clustering and gravity of the planets being on one side, or the electromagnetic alignment of the planets and the solar polar magnetic fields peaking in strength as applied to Earth? We should look to last year when an incredibly out-of-place sunspot minimum surge in solar activity came with a magnitude 8 event of its own in Mexico. Certainly no clustering of the planets this time, but Earth was lined up with the great blue outer gatekeeper. We saw Mercury and Jupiter opposing the Sun just two days later, Uranus on deck to get in on Mercury's orbit, and as Venus did approach an alignment with Ceres towards the end of the flaring uptick, it had sneakily gotten one with Saturn during the core of the uptick as well. Of course, by now, all but the newcomers among you know that the earthquake and solar flaring uptick occurred during another of the positive peaks of the solar polar fields. Same goes for many of the magnitude 8 events since records began. Otherwise, they tend to come more often at negative peaks and polarity reversals. For example, a 4 to 1 ratio seen here of those positive peaks to reversals. Let's take a moment to recall this chart from our first book, showing the most significant solar flares and geomagnetic storms ever recorded, and the fact that planetary geometry was significant from an alignment standpoint. It wasn't gravitational clustering, it's much more like the tuning fork example. So, is this clustering of planets on one side of the sun totally irrelevant? Well, no. Clusters offer more chances for alignments, more so than if the planets were spread out across the solar system. But that is it. It's not the clustering or the gravity, it is the increased likelihood of the relevant alignments. We do indeed have significant alignments coming up here during the end of the cluster. So with that in mind, let's recall our two earthquake outlooks from June. The imminent forecast of continued quiet has held true and we have still not had a magnitude 7 earthquake. Today is the five month mark without one. This puts us into a rare category of earthquake mega droughts. Now last year it happened too. It began a month earlier in January and had already ended by this time last year. Thus far, we're still lagging a bit behind what occurred in 2017. But otherwise, the patterns are clear. We're about a month behind last year's marks where the same positive peaks in solar magnetism accompanying big quakes from the last magnetic cycle waited out the polarity reversal in what we term as the polar magnetic recovery period, where the annual oscillation began again, and as you can see on the right, that is coming back. The first real peak was last year. We're off and running once more. Solar magnetism is surging into positive again this year, and so being a month behind does not give one much solace at all. Tough to see how we could make it another month without a magnitude 7 event as the solar polar fields have already begun to surge. The official forecast is for us to catch up fast and cut back that one month lag we're in now. The official date for that would be August 17th when we would match the 2017 drought period day for day. Again, 
not expected to get there. Planetary Geometry is updated monthly for website members at suspiciousobservers.org. We greatly appreciate your support. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.